and I should okay so I've been asked to talk about atmospheric effects and this lovely picture uh, you know a picture is worth a thousand words in this case you need a space station which is something like 200 billion dollars so if you think telescopes are expensive you know, these are these are even better right um, anyway so that's the earth's atmosphere it's uh, this nice thin layer of gas that provides a cozy place for us to live and provides um, you know oxygen for us to breathe and protection from cosmic radiation um, and it's even though it doesn't seem dry on with the weather we've had this weekend, it's drier than the ocean. <laughs> you know, fish live in the ocean. We all started in the ocean, but we evolved to live on land in the atmosphere. And there were these convenient plants that generated oxygen. Anyway, that's a different talk. So I'll talk about two topics, really. <laughs> Transparency in the atmosphere, especially in the millimeter and submillimeter and turbulence in the atmosphere and how it affects millimeter and submillimeter observations. Uh, most of this material is covered in uh, Dick Thompson's book, chapter 13, which has lots of uh, mathematical detail that I won't go into. Uh, there's one further topic, which is the static refraction caused by the atmosphere. Um, it's not a very exciting topic, so I'm not going to talk about it. You need to get it right so your telescope points in the right way, but it's a fairly simple calculation, so I'm not going to discuss it. Okay, so the atmosphere is transparent in some spectral regions and not other, and this is a cartoon of the, of the entire um, electromagnetic spectrum. In the radio, there's a big um, window with all these windows where you can see out to space. Then in the far infrared, water vapor in particular, but also other atmospheric gases um, absorb radiation and cause the atmosphere to be more or less opaque. Then there is a window in the visible, so we can see things, and that's why we have eyes that work in the visible. And then in the uh, short wavelengths, we've got things like the ozone layer, which protect us from uh, ultraviolet radiation and high energy radiation. And I should point out at the very highest um, frequencies, the shortest wavelength um, radiation, you actually use the atmosphere as a detector. If you want to look at high energy gamma rays, you use the atmosphere as your detector. The gamma rays come in, they hit a um, proton in the upper atmosphere, and this air shower causes Zarenkov radiation that you can pick up with a telescope. So you're actually using the atmosphere as your as your detector. But we're down here in the submillimeter, and it's it's more or less transparent on a good day. Uh, okay, so a bit of mathematics. Um, it's important to remember that in the uh, submillimeter, like the infrared, the sky is bright. We're used to thinking that we go out at night and the sky is dark and there's lots of pretty stars out there, and, but you have bright stars on a, on a um, dark background. In the submillimeter in, and in the infrared, it's not like that. You have a bright background and you have very faint stars on a very bright background. And so this is a little um, back of the envelope calculation of the sky. Brightness temperature, T sky, is the physical temperature of the atmosphere times this x, uh, 1 minus exponential, which is the optical depth, the, what I call tau here, the optical depth of the atmosphere, how much, how much absorption there is in the atmosphere. Uh, and that uh, optical depth depends on um, what zenith angle you're looking at. If you're looking straight up, you're looking through one thickness of the atmosphere. As you look further over in zenith angle, you look through more of the atmosphere. You get over 60 degrees zenith <coughs> angle. You're looking through twice as much atmosphere as you do when you're looking at the zenith. So that's that exponential. And then the last term on the end is just the background radiation temperature, which is attenuated by passing through the atmosphere. 
so if you throw some numbers in, the atmosphere is about 250 Kelvin. Let's say you're observing at 30 degrees zenith angle, so you're pretty close to overhead. The background radiation is 3 degrees, and let's say it's 10% absorption. You get a sky temperature of about 30 degrees. And later on, you'll hear about receivers and things like that, but this is comparable to the receiver temperature. So the sky provides, a, a, it's bright, and it provides a large fraction of the system noise, uh, the noise in, in your receiving system. Uh, and that, in fact, the contribution to the noise in the receiving system, the brightness is really the primary limitation of the sky rather than just the attenuation. You know, the attenuation is 10%. You could lose 10%, but it's this additional noise that's doubling the receiver noise, maybe, uh, that really has, has the effect. Okay, uh, and just to finish up, how bright are the sources we're looking at? So we're looking at this 30 degree uh, brightness uh, sky, and what's a typical source brightness? Well, Uranus is a calibrator. It's a planet, it's in the outer atmosphere, but it's one of the things we use as calibrators. It's pretty small, it's three and a half arc seconds. Our six meter antennas at the SMA have a beam width at 230 gigahertz of about 54 arc seconds. Uranus is about 100 degrees, it's cold in the outer atmosphere, in the outer solar system, but its radiation temperature is about 100 degrees. But this is just this little spot in the middle of a big beam. So it's diluted uh, by the beam area. And so the dilution is just the ratio of areas. Um, there's an attenuation through the atmosphere. This is its original temperature. So it ends up only being about half a, half a degree. So here you are, you're looking at um, a half degree source on a 30 degree background. So this is uh, you know, about 1% a little more, one and a half percent. So imagine going out during the day and you look on a nice day, it's a nice blue sky. Could you see a 1% uh, star out there? Now, if you're very clever, you can see Venus during the day um, under some circumstances, um, but it's really challenging when you have a big bright background to see um, a small, a uh, faint star. So this is the challenge in the submillimeter and, and the infrared. It's this <clears throat> bright background and weak sources. And that's why we use differential techniques such as interferometry where we, where we have a differential uh, signal between the two antennas or if it, for single dish, uh, and there's a talk tom uh, tomorrow about single dish observing, you'll use um, uh, scanning, uh, scan the telescope around to make differential measurements and subtract um, one part of the sky from the other and look what's left over and that's your sources. Okay, so the sky is bright. What is the atmosphere made of? And um, this is uh, elementary geophysics, I guess, atmospheric physics. It's mostly nitrogen and oxygen, um, argon, little, little carbon dioxide that gets everybody very excited these days. These, <laughs> these um, components are very stable uh, and they have a scale height of about eight kilometers. If you go up eight kilometers, the um, atmospheric pressure is down by a factor of E. If you prefer half, um, half height, it's about five and a half kilometers. So you go up, uh, it's exponentially distributed. It's, it's quite stable. These things don't change very much. Uh, there is a lapse rate. The temperature gets colder as you go up in the troposphere. That's about six and a half Kelvin. So things are colder as you go up. Uh, it's important to remember there are inversion layers quite often, which um, where the temperature, instead of going continuing to go down, will go up for a little while. And that has uh, implications for atmospheric circulation and also for the distribution of water. Water is the big, uh, the major contribution to atmospheric uh, absorption in the millimeter and submillimeter throughout the far infrared. And it is very variable. 
Uh, some places are very dry, like deserts. Some places are very wet, like tropical rainforests. Uh, the amount of water in the, in the atmosphere varies you know, up to 3% in some places and down to almost nothing in others. And it has a much smaller scale height than everything else. It, it's only a kilometer or two scale height. So it's much more concentrated in the lower atmosphere than everything else, which is why you want to go put telescopes on high mountains. This is uh, when the pixels catch up with it. Um, this is a map from a NASA reanalysis project of atmospheric water vapor. This is the typical amount of water vapor at sea level. Um, the, thick, the amount of water in the column up to space expressed as the number of millimeters of water. So if you take all the water from ground to space and you condense it into liquid water, this is how many millimeters you get. And you can see this thing goes out to 40 millimeters of water, right? You know, that's quite a lot of water. Um, and no surprise, in the equatorial regions, you know, these areas are tropical jungles, right? The Amazon, uh, Congo Basin, Southeast Asia. They're very wet places. Uh, but for uh, infrared and submillimeter astronomy, we want very dry places. And there's only a few places in the world where you can do this stuff. And three of them are Mauna Kea. Now, in Hawaii, it do doesn't really show up with this resolution. But because Mauna Kea is so high, even though there's a lot of water out there, you're above quite a lot of it most of the time. Shanantor in northern Chile is the site of Halma. <coughs> And the South Pole, at the South Pole, is um, also very good. Uh, there are some other areas, um, you know, Greenland. Uh, there's a telescope that's been built recently in Greenland. Uh, there are some other people that are exploring in, the, in Tibet. Uh, but these are the, for the moment, the South Pole, Shanantor, and Mauna Kea are the places to do some millimeter astronomy. They are the only real places to do it in the world. There's Mauna Kea. Uh, and at sunset, and once the pixels catch up, you can see, does this, is this a pointer? Maybe not. Oh, well. Um, anyway, up on the ridge, just for amusement, up on the ridge, you have Canada, France, Hawaii, Gemini, the UH telescope, and UCURT, and then all those little things up on the ridge are the tourists who go up at sunset and watch the sunset. And this obviously was taken um, looking the other way, and you can see the shadow of the mountain sticking up out there. But what I want you to notice is all of the clouds are below the top of the mountain. And that's an inversion layer that I was talking about, which is trapping the water vapor below the top of the mountain uh, and making Mauna Kea uh, somewhat drier than it would be just based on the scale height. Uh, so with a scale height of two kilometers, uh, Mauna Kea is four kilometers high. You should be uh, a factor E squared less than sea level. Uh, and in fact, it's a bit better than that. Uh, we say that Mauna Kea is about 90% of the water vapor. Okay. Um, I'll go into uh, the details of the um, absorption spectrum here for a few minutes. Uh, this is the energy level diagram of water. Water has two um, orient uh, isomers, uh, para and an ortho. You can stick the hydrogens on symmetrically or asymmetrically when you make a water molecule. And they have different rotational spectra because the, the um, symmetry changes the um, moment of inertia of the rotation. Uh, and so these are the energy uh, levels from the ground state up to various excited states. What I've marked here are the uh, frequency in gigahertz of the transitions between them. And you'll see that these transitions, here's one at 560 gigahertz, 750 gigahertz, 988 gigahertz, uh, the 183 gigahertz up at the top. Uh, these are the trans are transitions right 
in the submillimeter band, and they're very um, strong transitions because they're almost ground state transitions. We're in ground state, first excited, two, three, uh, second excited states. They're very low-lying uh, transitions, so these are very, very saturated lines for any amount of water you have. Uh, and this is a calculated spectrum of the atmosphere. It's a bit busy here. Uh, what we have is the zenith transmission of the atmosphere from about 100 gigahertz to 1,000 gigahertz. Uh, and it's calculated for three amounts of water vapor for the altitude and temperature of Mauna Kea. So the black curve, no, the red curve is for two millimeters of water vapor. The black curve is for one millimeter of water vapor. And the green curve is for 200 microns of water vapor. And approximately that's median 20, 25% and the very best ever seen on Mauna Kea in terms of the amount of water vapor. The blue arrows show you the location of many of those water lines. And for instance, this one at 550 gigahertz is an almost ground state transition. It is very, very saturated, very pressure broadened because it's in, the pressure is high in the, in the lower atmosphere and there's a lot of water vapor. And these water vapor lines define these windows uh, where we can observe. This bar here shows the SMA uh, receiving bands from about 190 to 400 gigahertz. We have our 200, 240 gigahertz receivers in here and our 345, 400 gigahertz receivers. The purple bar shows the ALMA receiving bands, which go to a somewhat lower frequency and include this 600 and the 900 gigahertz windows, the 750 and the 950 gigahertz windows. So you see that the water vapor makes a tremendous difference to the amount, uh, to the observing conditions. Um, uh, and how hard it is to, to observe in the submillimeter. Okay, how do you measure the amount of water vapor? Well, you take this sky temperature uh, equation and you can invert it if you measure the sky temperature at different zenith angles and you can invert it to get the uh, optical depth. And this shows the optical depth, typical optical depth <laughs> over um, many years, 30 some years on Mauna Kea, a record we've had from an instrument, um, and it shows that the uh, median amount of water vapor here is just around two millimeters of water. And then it gets down to one millimeter of water maybe 20, 25 percent of the time. There is a seasonal dependence. The seasonal dependence is not terribly strong, but January, you know, the winter months are generally better than the summer months. There's a daily dependence. The afternoon is worse than the night, which is why we observe at night. And then the yearly de uh, annual dependence scatters around. The interannual variation is somewhat uh, higher than the seasonal variation. Uh, this compares Mauna Kea labeled as the CSO with the South Pole and with ALMA with similar instruments. Uh, the ALMA site is better than Mauna Kea and so is the South Pole. South Pole's kind of hard to get to. Uh, this is just a point that we often talk about water vapor as if it's the only atmospheric parameter, but it's very important to remember temperature and altitude are also important, especially if you compare the South Pole, which has a very different, much colder temperature than uh, the temperate sites. Uh, this is the relationship between water vapor and optical depth. And for the temperate sites, it's very similar, but the slope of this is very different for the South Pole because it's much colder. So the same amount of water vapor gives you a higher optical depth at the South Pole because it's colder. 
Uh, this is a, another uh, set of measurements made at 350 microns, 850 gigahertz, showing the same thing, Mauna Kea, South Pole, Alma, and a high site in Chile. And just for fun, I threw in a telescope, uh, a picture taken some years ago of a very high site in Chile where the receiver lab had a small telescope for a while. And these clouds, again, there's an inversion layer. The difference is these clouds here, Alma is below those clouds. So this, this was um, 500 meters above the Alma site on a morning where Alma was below the clouds and we were above. And one of those observing this was measurements from an um, atmospheric Fourier transform spectrometer showing the uh, transparency. And this translates to about 100 microns of water, which is 10 times as much as on Mars, but you're getting into the same, same ballpark. OK, now I need to tell, tell you about turbulence in five minutes. OK, so turbulence in the atmosphere causes a number of unfortunate effects. It decorrelates the interferometer signals, what uh, Kijiao was talking about uh, and Cardo was talking about. You're correlating your signals. If you decorrelate your signals, that will reduce your visibility amplitudes uh, and give you a, a false view or a, a corrupted view of the image you're looking at. Uh, this is equivalent to convolving uh, the, your image of your source with a seeing disk. The uh, mathematics are identical, or very close to identical to the mathematics of optical seeing. The difference is we're primarily uh, concerned with water vapor in the submillimeter and, um, uh, rather than thermal turbulence in the optical. Uh, single dish imaging, it also has an effect all um, the turbulence um, in the atmosphere causes the emission of the atmosphere to be splotchy and that uh, splotchiness changes with time and space and that causes, um, if you're making a differential measurement, you're subtracting blank sky from source. If the blank sky is changing, then it's hard to subtract from, from the uh, source position. Uh, the turbulence is actually fairly poorly correlated with transparency. Um, and you can think of this, uh, if you think of a swimming pool, you can have ripples on the surface of the swimming pool. The, the size of the ripples on the swimming pool surface don't necessarily have anything to do with the depth of the swimming pool. Okay, so here's an interferometer. Uh, we're measuring on our simple interferometer, we're measuring this excess delay here from one um, and uh, side, line of sight to the other. And that delay tells us what this angle is or where the source is in the sky. Well, imagine we have a cloud that's in one of these beams and not in the other. And the cloud is moving in and out. Uh, that variable additional delay is we're, we're just going to get a different angle, an angle that varies. And that's going to confuse us about where the source is. And if you integrate the signals with this varying uh, angle, phase angle, then that will cause the, the amplitude you measure and your, your average, even if it doesn't change the average angle, it will lower the amplitude because sometimes you'll be uh, summing up a vector in one direction with a vector in another direction and that average will be a smaller uh, amplitude. And so that corrupts your position and lowers your con uh, contrast. And so instead of one cloud in the atmosphere, you actually have a whole ensemble of clouds that have uh, various uh, sizes, different sizes. Uh, and these, uh, the turbulence is characterized by, by what's called the structure function, which is just the phase, this the ensemble average of the squared difference of the phase between two points separated by distance d. Uh, this is also the square of the uh, phase fluctuations. And there are three um, 
three cases we distinguish. One is when the separation between your antennas is smaller than the thickness of the turbulent layer. And we call this thick turbulence because it's a three-dimensional turbulent process. And this gives you a power law in the structure function of five-thirds. If it's thin, in other words, your distance between antennas is larger than the thickness of the layer, then it's a, a flatter power law, two-thirds. And then on very long baselines, the um, fluctuations are uncorrelated, which is good. They stop growing. And this is a numerical model of Kolmogorov turbulence, where we have the thick three-dimensional turbulence growing in, in, at short baselines, and then the thinner turbulence growing at longer baselines. This was calculated for a two-kilometer thickness layer, and you get a break in the, in the power law at about a third of that, 700 meters. Okay, we have a little interferometer at the SMA, an interfer auxiliary interferometer, it has five stations to measure uh, the atmospheric fluctuations. And this, these are the slopes of the structure functions measured by this interferometer, and they're intermediate between thick and thin. So most of the time it appears that the, uh, turbulence we're measuring is somewhere in this transition range between thick and thin turbulence. Okay. Uh, Mauna Kea, the stability, uh, has a diurnal and seasonal variation. This is the uh, time of day, and you see uh, in the afternoon, this is the Catholic fluctuations. They increase tremendously in the afternoon, which is another reason we observe at night rather than the afternoon where the uh, turbulence is worse. There are, unlike uh, atmospheric absorption, where the only thing you can do is move your telescope to a different, better site, there are some possibilities for compensation of, of turbulence. Um, and I've listed them here. I'll just show, a, uh, because I'm running out of time, I'll show a couple of examples. This is from the VLA. Uh, <coughs> The solid dots are the measurements of the phase. Um, uh, just looking at a calibrator at 22 gigahertz, and you see that the structure function increases through the thick um, regime, and then it slopes off uh, in, through the thin regime, and then in the long baseline regime, it's fairly constant, the um, RMS phase fluctuations. If you switch quickly to a calibrator and back and forth between your target and your calibrator quickly on the order of five minutes or even 20 seconds, you can reduce the phase fluctuations because the atmosphere doesn't evolve slower than you're switching back and forth between your source and your calibrator. So you can freeze the fluctuations. And if you can switch your antennas back uh, as fast as 20 seconds, then you can reduce these fluc uh, fluctuations dramatically uh, with this fast switching technique. But you have to be able to switch your antennas back and forth from your source to a strong calibrator very quickly. And this technique is used for some observations at the VLA. This is uh, some examples from ALMA. Uh, this is the example of using a 183 gigahertz water vapor radiometer where you're measuring the brightness of the, of the water vapor, which is causing the, which is the turbulent element. And you're using that measurements of the brightness to correct the interferometer phase. And in the top panel, you'll see that in this case, in the middle of September a few years ago, uh, it was successful in reducing the phase from the raw uh, phases, which are the are the pluses to the open diamonds, which are the corrected by a factor of three to five or something, which is significant in reducing the amount of phase of uh, scatter. You also see in that one, there's a transition between the uh, slope of the structure function, uh, power law, uh, on short baselines and long baselines. What's interesting here is um, two weeks later, they did the similar experiment uh, but the, uh, there's almost no reduction. First of all, the 
fluctuations are much smaller, but there's almost no reduction uh, through the water vapor radiometer corrections. Um, even though the am total amount of water vapor was about the same in both sides. This indicates that perhaps a lot of this is some dry air turbulence that's not taken into account through water vapor uh, radiometry. And then the last example I'll show you is something Cardo has been working on. If we take the data from our little interferometer at the SMA, along with um, uh, information from our receivers and from measurements of ozone lines in the atmosphere through our um, autocorrelations, you can make a, a little model of the atmosphere and see how it slides across the array. And then use that model for the phase screen to correct the interferometer phases. And in this little example, um, here you have the phases attached to each antenna in the interferometer. And these are before correction, and this is after correction. And this is, the red line is before correction, and the blue line is after correction, the coherence of the signal. So this has the promise of correcting uh, the phases and making uh, much more of the observing time available to us at the SMA. So, questions? The good thing about the atmosphere is that as observers, you can't do very much about it <laughs> because you're not going to move the telescope somewhere else. That's a big project. And implementing these correction schemes it takes quite people have been trying this for 25 years and they've been somewhat successful, but it's not a solved problem. Yeah. Is that top vector the average of all of them? I'm going to, this is Cardo's slide, so I'm going to ask Cardo. So the, the top slightly differently colored one is the phase response from our little interferometer that's looking up at the geostationary satellite. Yeah, it's, it's supposed to be green, but it shows up as kind of a, almost like a little on the screen. P green or something. I mean, that actually, that interferometer has five elements, so you should have... Five, five times 20 baselines. Right. So this is some average of those, right? No, so it's, it's actually just the one, because this was in subcompact, uh, it's just the one that covers the subcompact array because the other ones basically just don't have the... They're all somewhere else? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. 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 So I'm going to say in the interest of time, we'll thank Simon again.